Welcome to episode seven of Alternate Realities, the podcast series where we literally look at alternate realities, different perspectives on life. My guest today is Dr. John E. Clark. He is the Director of Residency and Professional Experiential Programs at Tanaha College of Pharmacy, the University of South Florida in the United States. It's a privilege to have him share his story with us today. John literally changed his own history with the flick of a pen while he was in the queue to sign up for his college days. He actually changed majors. He's had an incredible career, and now he spends a lot of time helping students to find their own way with their own careers. But also on top of that, over the last few years, he has been researching a very interesting subject and is about to publish a book about African-American pharmacists and the history that goes with them is fascinating. So I'm so pleased to welcome him to the show today. So good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you, John, today. It's a great privilege for you to join us uh, on the Alternate Realities podcast. And I'm so interested to hear your story because you've got an incredible career behind you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to just our conversation. Well, I know you're doing some interesting things at the moment, but I'd like to start sort of asking where you were born and where you grew up. That's an interesting, I, I get asked that question quite often and I surprise people when I tell them, I usually tell them jokingly that I was born on an Indian reservation and I'm referring to the native Indians that were inhabitants of this country uh, before the uh, Europeans came in. So, uh, it, and it's partly true because my grandfather owned a farm in a little little area called Conhatta, Mississippi. I can't remember, it's an Indian name and I don't remember the name, what it really means. But it was a farmhouse that he owned, and it was during a time when hospitals were not quite welcoming Black people into those hospitals. So most of the babies that were born were born by midwives in their homes. So my mother lived at home at the time, or she had come back home after being married, and um, she was pregnant, by the way. So I I was born by a midwife in my grandfather's home in a little town called Conhatta, Mississippi. And that's about, it's, at the time, it was probably about five to 500 to 600 people there. Today, it's close to around 5,000. So that's where I was born. And I moved from there to another little town that's about 20 miles, maybe 30 miles away, called Forest, Mississippi. And that's where I grew up and went to primary and secondary um, schools. And actually, you know, although you say that um, black people were not particularly welcome in in those days, you know, actually over in the UK, it it was a standard thing, you know, before the NHS really got going, that babies were born at home and the community midwife went out to anybody in this country. So I think, you know, going back many years, a lot of children were actually born in wherever their home was. You know, it wasn't the the kind of hospital birth thing back then, was it? Was not, no, it was, um, and even when they did, even when they did started allowing people to come into the hospital, the hospital was segregated. And I can remember having a, a little tumor growth on my right upper thigh it just kept getting bigger and bigger to the point where I couldn't walk. So I went into the, my mother took me to the doctor and the doctor said, I have to get surgery right away because this thing had grown so big. It was about the size of a, maybe a golf ball. And so I can clearly remember that day, uh, although I was very young, walking into the front door of this hospital. And we got to the front entrance and there was a lady sitting at the desk and to my left was where she sent all the white people. To my right was where they sent all the black people. So I can remember going down this long hallway. I had a bed almost at the end of the, the hallway of this, um, this hospital on the left side. I still remember, I, I, and I, I could be wrong, but that's my recollection that it was on the left side of the, of the, uh, of the floor. So that was um, my experience with my, it, it, it was segregation, but it was also a way of life. You didn't, 
I didn't know any better. You know, I had not been anywhere else other than there. And, and so when it was, it was accepted as, as normal life, but I, but when I look back upon it now, it's, it's kind of intriguing to me. And you ask a lot of questions about it today that you didn't ask then. But that was my, um, that was my healthcare experience at a very early, early age for. And, to, and how old were you then? I, I, I'm, I'm guessing I was somewhere around eight years old. I can't remember exactly. I was about eight years old. And um, that was, um, I can remember the pain of waking up and feeling those little tube, drainage tubes he had put in my leg and, and, and really afraid of the doctor because I never had to be treated by a doctor before. That was, that was probably one of my first times being having a doctor put his hands on me. So I was a little, little nervous and frightened by it. And then when he had to pull the tubes out, I was just very frightened because it was so painful to take those tubes out. It was actually can, just one okay. tube. So. Yeah, I can imagine. And that, that's the major difference between the UK and uh, uh, the United States is that we didn't have segregation here. So, you know, community midwives would go out and it would be irrelevant what colour you wear, were and what background you came from. You know, they, they went out to see everybody. And yeah. so, you know, it as you say, when you're growing up, that was your experience because that's the way it was for you. Exactly. So how did you get into, you know, having, especially having, now you're telling me about this experience about, you know, your first experience of, of being treated by a doctor. How did you yourself actually get into studying pharmacology? Well, it, it was really sort of an accident. It was really sort of an, um, not an accident, but it was started because I had done very well in chemistry in high school. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in college. So when I applied, I, my chemistry teacher, who was someone I favored quite a lot, he suggested I, he thought I was, was a capable person to be a chemist. So I put on my registration forms that I wanted to major in chemistry. And when I went off to college, I went off very far away from home, my first uh, experience of being away from home, and I had no idea of what school was like, what it was, what you were supposed to do and how things were done. And so when I was standing in the registration line, I also did not understand that, that students, some students took the same classes, although they had different majors. So I overheard these two guys that were standing in the line ahead of me discussing their class schedule. And as I heard them speak about it, I looked at mine and the classes they were discussing were the exact same classes that I was taking and with the same with the same professor. So I, I just happened to ask them, were they chemistry majors the same as me? And they says, no, they were pharmacy majors. I said, well, how could that be? And we're taking the same classes. I had no idea that how that worked. So the, the guy turned around and he wasn't very friendly, by the way. He just sort of, he felt like I was annoying him. So he turned around, looked at me and said, I don't know. I don't know. Just change it, change it to pharmacy. And I thought it was just as simple. I thought it was fine to do that. So I basically, and during this time, the registration process was very paper, it's a paper system, very manual, manual, not like it is today, it was electronic. So I, I took my pen and I drew a line through the box that had my major listed, which was chemistry. I drew a line through it and wrote over the top of it, pharmacy. So the young lady at the registration counter, she registered me as a pharmacy student. And so I got excited, called my, my mother at home and told her I'm going to go to the pharmacy school. I'm going to become a pharmacist. And she got all excited and I even got more excited. So then I, the semester started and I was taking classes for about maybe a month or so into the, the courses. And then I got a call from the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences where chemistry majors are supposed to be. And he called me into his office to let me know that I was in the wrong school. I was supposed to be in the College of Arts and Sciences, not in the College of Pharmacy. So I, I, I sort of begged him to leave me there. Can I just stay there? I didn't think it made any difference at all. But to him it did because 
part of his money that he makes as a dean for the college is because based on the tuition that students pay designated to that to that college division. So to him, it, it meant it, it meant a lot, you know. So I didn't understand that at all. So I said, please just let me stay at, at least to the end of the semester. And so he told me that he would allow me to do that provided my grades were good. And they weren't very good at the end of that semester. I barely passed that semester. I had a few D grades and, 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 a, and a C average. And, but something strange really happened. My, um, his name was Dean Williams. Dean, Dean Williams um, became ill. And he later died, not at that time, but he later died from his illness. And no one ever asked me to change my major. So I stayed in pharmacy. So wow. I kind, of, I kind of went on through school from there and graduated as a pharmacist. Um, as a pharmacist. You kind of started out in a queue with the chemistry box ticked right. and then you crossed it out and then you changed it to pharmacy and then right. the dean's brought a little bit of economics into it because it's going to affect him in terms of <laughs> uh, and then surely by just fluke he's got sick and you know you just carried on yeah and I never did understand why the college of pharmacy didn't didn't put me out you I never understood but no one ever said anything to me in the college of pharmacy so I I went all. I went on. Went through for. At the time, it was a five-year program, so I went through for five years, and no one ever said a word. They just chucked me in the college, and so. Um, and when did your when did your grades actually start to improve? They never did. <laughs> they never did improve. I, I I came so close of getting put out of there. It was amazing. I think about it now, and I tell my students when I talk with my students about how they, what they need to do to succeed. I always tell the story, I was not a good student. I was a good student in high school, but in college, I was not a good student. I never got my grades up above a C. I was always in that really low level, academic performing level. So, I, I, cause I had, no, I had no aspirations of going beyond that. I didn't, I knew that if I knew, if I had plans to go to graduate school, do postgraduate studies or something like that, I would, it would be necessary that you keep your grades at a very high level. So none of that mattered to me because I never planned, I never was thinking about going to graduate school. But I, I did, I was not a good student. I, I was a good student, but not good at performing in the classes. I always knew that I could succeed, but I just had trouble understanding how to manage my way through different coursework. And and so it made it made myself look like I was a failure, but in my heart, I always always knew that I could succeed, and that probably came from my earlier background with people who had mentored me and and made me feel that you can do whatever you want to do. But although it didn't look like it when you look at it on paper, I was not doing very well at all. Everybody in my class was always ahead of me. Well, that brings me on to something that, you know, always fascinates me because, you know, some of our most influential mentors can appear very early on in our lives. And sometimes, obviously, in the middle of a course, it kind of varies from person to person. So who was your most influential mentor? Um, during the, I had several, but one that really helped me out in the early part of my, my life was my, my high school principal. He, and, and, and that was largely due to fear. <laughs> he was one of those fearful guys who would, who would put, who would instill this fear into just about the entire class. You know, he'd come around and he didn't smile very much, and he always stern way about himself. And he was, he was extremely difficult to uh, as a as a principal. But he created this feeling that you were obligated to succeed because that's what he drilled in you. That he didn't he didn't accept failure in anything because he was also was a for a while he was the football coach and he had a winning a winning team for several years because he just instilled this value into into everyone that you do not lose. You do you you always treat yourself, think of yourself as a winner and he and he drilled it 
<laughs> into us with a lot of fear. If you had, you made a mistake, you got, you, you all, you would regret it. So you did everything you could not to make a mistake because of, uh, you had to face him, you know, if you did. And so I, I think that played a part with me feeling like I could always succeed, even though I kept not performing very well um, for a number of years. And I could never let myself fall back and fall down and feel pity, pitiful for myself because something kept making me get up and try again. And I really do believe it had a lot to do with him. And then um, some of the other um, the teachers and, and people that he also uh, employed, I think he may have frightened them too because they were the same way. The school that I went to, everybody were, were behind you. They were all pushing you in the same way. It was a certain kind of family mentor, mentorship that I just don't see that anymore. I don't see it at my school. I didn't see it when I went to college. And so that had a lot to do, I think, with leadership and the people who were in charge that sort of instill those values, not only in the students, but in the teachers that have to teach you as well. He didn't believe in, in having a failing record. And that record depended a lot on the teachers. And so he, um, he instilled those values in them as well. And, and he's probably my most earliest mentor that played a part in sort of jump-starting my career. And then after that, there were several other people that sort of came into play. And it sounds like, you know, because when when looking at things, putting my life coaching head on, you know, we always look at core values. And it sounds like, you know, you had that instilled in you at a very young age. And so, you know, one of the things going back to the earlier in the conversation, you said that even though you weren't performing very well, you did nevertheless still believe that you could succeed. And you certainly did, didn't you? Because you did graduate. Yeah, I certainly, yeah, I did. I, I didn't, and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't, but it was always um, something that I rejoiced and celebrated. And that um, and, I, and I'm the same way now. I, I always celebrate in the moment. And then once the celebration is over, I turn and look to see what's next because you can't just revel in the excitement forever. And so, um, I, and part of that too, I have, I, I, part of that revelation has to do with the fear of, failing again. So I guess that f those failures did have an impact on me. I just did not want to continue to be failing. So I would not get to a point of thinking that I have made it to the mountaintop. You know, I always thought that you are still climbing and, and you can't just stop on what you've built up to this point. You have to keep working at it because you don't want to go back. I always felt that as soon as I relax and pretend I and act like I'm, I know everything, that I've done everything, then that's, that's going to be the beginning of my failure. And that's what I try to avoid. I think that's really a marker of success, actually, because if you look at most people who become successful in life, what they do is they, they achieve a goal and then you know you're you're using the analogy of a mountain and climbing a mountain well you, know, you get to one peak and then you can see another one that you've got to climb um but whichever way you look at it it's just another goal isn't it and, I, and what i'm hearing is and this is the story of people who are successful is that they they complete a project and they do rejoice in that but then they're looking at what's going to be my next project exactly you know i, I think of it like um I use, I use a lot of sports analogies, analogies because I played sports in high school and I played about four different sports. And you, you, can, you can hear it now, even um, if you watch some of the sports athletes now and coaches, particularly from the coaches, they always say that there's always somebody better than you. There's always someone waiting to beat, to beat you in a game, you know? And, 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 that, and I actually believe that. So it's the same thing occurs when you're trying to work at your career. When you think you, when you think you're the best, there's always someone that's better. And so you have to keep striving to be the best. And, and I, I went in, I was in Jamaica teaching at a, 
at a um, science school there several years ago, and I got invited. I, I got invited to the dean's office to meet her, meet the lady that was there. So I sat at her, sat in the front, in front of her, facing her. She was sitting at her desk. I'm sitting across the desk from her. But she had this big sign sitting right behind her head. And I know she strategically put it there because it was sitting right behind her head. So you couldn't help but look at her and read the sign behind her. And it said, and I'll never forget the words on it. It says, if you think you're good, be better. If you think you're better, be the best. If you think you're the best, then prove it. And I wrote that down and I had it in my, I put it in my office. I actually made a sign of it myself and put it in my office so that when students come into my office, they'll see the same thing behind, behind my head like I saw it behind hers. And but you've now got it strategically positioned in your office so that they can read it. <laughs> yes, exactly. I did the same thing because it had it had an impact on me that was that was quite remarkable because it really sort of touched on what I how I thought of myself as well. In, in, in that, you know, if you think you if you think you're the best, there's probably somebody better. So you gotta be the best. And if you think you're the best, you have to you have to prove it. And so I, 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 I still, I still have that same thought, and when I, especially when I think about it from a sports perspective. So, you talk about teaching. When did you first move into teaching? I, I moved in. I, I didn't. I've always been teaching, but not formally, not at a academic level. I taught uh, as more of a, as a what they call an adjunct. Professor, which is someone who who takes students for training primarily. So in 2012, I got a job because of some changes that were happening there. I was working primarily in in pharmacy practice at a hospital. And they decided to 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 uh, eliminate several of the job positions because of budget cuts. So my job was one of those. Mine and maybe. Um, about 200 more people. And so at that point, I was debating of what, what am I going to do now? And I wanted to be somewhere where I had a very stimulating environment that would keep me sort of growing. And I did plan on going into academia, but one of my former students, she, a young, uh, one of the young ladies at the college called me she had been my student when she was probably uh, right out of college herself. And she called me and asked me if I would consider a position working for her, which was kind of strange because she said that she always wanted to work with me from the time that she first met me. And I said, no, I don't think I want to be in academia. And so she made me um, another, she made another request and I, I didn't, I turned it down. Then all of a sudden I found myself sort of wandering around doing all kinds of different things. I worked as a consultant. I worked for a, a, what they call correctional health facility, which is basically a maximum security prison, you know, that has a health clinic inside the prison. I, I, I never dreamed I would be, be doing something like that, but I found myself inside, locked up in this prison every day and I kept, it was actually interesting because I had never done that before. But after a while, I didn't see myself going anywhere. I kept thinking, gosh, this is not going to get me anywhere. Um, How did you find that going going into a maximum well, security prison every day? Oh, it, well, it, initially it was, it was kind of nerve wracking because you got to walk through the scanner, take out everything out of your pocket. You cannot carry your keys. You cannot carry your cell phone. You cannot even carry ink pens. So you leave all that stuff locked up in a little safe at the front of the entrance. And then you walk through a scanner. If anything got metal, they check you. Uh, uh, even pins, uh, safety pins, uh, and belts even, they make you pull your belt off and everything. So I, 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 after the first time it happened, I felt like, God, this is such a strange thing. And, and you go through door after door after door to get to where you need to be. For me, in my case, that was the pharmacy. So I walked through one door, 
you stand if you stand there, there's cameras all around you looking at you. You can't see them, but there's look the securities are looking at you. Then they they ask you to show your ID, you show your ID, they buzz you through one door, you go to another door, they buzz you through another door until you finally get into your pharmacy. And then they lock, lock you inside of there as well. So it, it was, uh, it was. Because you're, you're in the room with the drugs, let's face it. So you, you're going to have to be locked in there. Exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> so, so I, 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 found, I found it quite um, amusing at first. And then I kept thinking, Lord, gosh, what, what, how did I get into this situation? So, but after being there for about a week or two, I actually got adjusted to it very quickly. The difficult part, I had two difficulties. One was that I had to do the inspection of the uh, drug storage areas in each section of the prison. They had the men on one side and the women were on the other side. And I have to go in there every day. Well, not every day. I think it was maybe once a week. And I have to check, check the drugs, check the drugs and make sure everything is there, lock it up. But the, the weirdest thing was that it was inside the recreational room where all the prisoners were. That's where they came to get their doses of medication. So it was recreational drugs? <laughs> no, no, there was actually prescription drugs. They were all on medication. <laughs> They had, they no, had no, I, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. It's just, a, oh, you know. Oh, no, no. But, but you're absolutely correct. You have to watch everything because no matter what it is, they found a way to use it in a way that somehow, I guess, uh, gave them the, the effect that they were getting high. That, that yeah. would be as simple as, a, as an aspirin. They would grind that aspirin up and snort it till they get a nosebleed, you know. So, wow. So, so so we had to we had to watch everything and I had to keep them at a distance. They always want to they're, they're most so many of them are con artists. I mean they that's they're very cunning. So you walk in the door, they stare you down, they look you over, they 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 actually they actually have to train us how to walk and how we walk in the room with them and how we even what we have on. You know, they tell us certain like no medals, no necklace. No watches, no ink pens, not, nothing like that. Because when they look at you, they look at your, look at your entire body to see what can they get from you, you know. And yeah. so some of them will someone walk up to you in a very friendly way and say, oh, you're new here. What is your name? You look like a fighter. Or I used to be a fighter. They don't do little games like that to try to get you to be friends with them. And and I and they want to shake your hand and all that stuff. And I said, no, no touching. I don't, you don't handshake. And I, and I think for you, obviously we're doing, you know, this as an audio podcast, you know, and having met you, you know, you are this kind of six foot four, very tall, very fit, very kind of sporty looking guy. So that would be a really easy thing for them to sort of come in and, and you know, with that sort of conversation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, I I had to I had to ask the um, the medical director to not put me in the women's side. I said, please, it's not that I don't like women, but I don't want to be on that side because when I walk in there, those women, man, you will not believe they come after you like I I can't even begin to explain it all to the point that I have to I have to. I actually requested to let the women, let the female staff that's working with me go into that room because I I don't want to deal with that. It was just, the women was just, they were worse than the men. <laughs> they were really worse than the men. So I had to ask that, that, that I don't work on that side. I would, I would, I would walk through the, through the area and it would be all, everybody knocking on the windows and ringing little bells and tapping to get my attention. I would just, wave my hand, keep my eyes in one direction and keep walking <laughs> because they had all kinds of ways of trying to figure out a way to get something out of you. So that, that, was, that was a unique experience. So that's how I ended up there. But I did find it interesting because I was able to contribute some things to the, to the medical staff and the team that when I got ready to leave, they, were, they, they really showed how much they appreciated me being there and didn't want me to leave, but I had to leave. And so I left there and ended up in academia. So leaving there, um, you know, where did you go next? And, and what was your next sort of step in, in going into the academic side of things? Well, I had to, 
I was I was living I, I still live in South Florida, which is near the Miami area. The job at the university was in Tampa, Florida, which is at least um, about a four hour, five hour drive by car, roughly 270 miles or so. And so I, I really had no intentions. I didn't really want to pack up and move, but I had to make a decision. I felt like I was not making any progress in my career. Being in a university teaching hospital where I was at, it was always something stimulating that allowed you to sort of, um, sort of um, feel like you were progressing all the time in your, in your career. And so um, I felt the best place for me to go would be in academia that would allow me to continue to experience. And it actually did, so that's how I ended up getting there. Well, you certainly had, an, I mean, you have an incredible CV and you've had an incredible career, but what I'm really interested in, in is, is talking a bit more about the one thing I know that you've got this massive project you've been working on at the moment and you're writing a book, aren't you? Yes. And how did, how did that come about? How did you start getting into that? Well... In academia, they all they expect you to publish. They expect you to write and publish and actually um, try to acquire grants and funds as part of your duty as a as a professor. So that was I had an obligation to do it for one thing, but I hadn't decided what I wanted to work on. And so um, I get a call from a lady that she and I have become friends to this day. Uh, she. Um, her name is Dr. Deborah Williams. She called me on the phone from New York and told me she was working with some young ladies on a, what they call a Women's Day program. And she, and one of the young ladies had asked her a question that she didn't know the answer to, which was, who was the first African-American female pharmacist in America? So she didn't know, so she calls me and I, I don't know how she got my number, but um, she tracked me down some kind of way. So when we, and I was busy when she made the phone call, and when I answered the phone. So I was focused on one thing and, and she had such a compelling voice that made me stop what I was doing. And I said, I, when she asked the question, I said, I have no idea who that is, but let me check since I'm at my computer. So I went on the internet and tried to find some people and I found a few African-American women. And the one who I thought it was, her name was Anna Louise James. She was a 1908 graduate from the Brooklyn College of Pharmacy, supposedly the first woman to graduate from that school. And, but I said, 1908, that seems a little late to me. And so I told the professor that I was speaking to that I didn't have the answer, but you yeah, have piqued my interest to the point that I'm going to look for it and look a little further to see if I can find the answer. So I started doing this research on African-American pharmacists. And I didn't know where to start because I've not been, I, I hadn't even thought about that type of research and did not know where to start. So then I started using some logic behind my thinking, some strategic thoughts about it. And I thought that if there if there was, if I'm going to find the first African-American woman who was a pharmacist, she, I, I deduced that she must have gone to school somewhere. So then I thought, well, uh, during the late 20th, uh, early 20th century, we had segregation in this country. So she couldn't have, she probably could not have went to a major university because they would not allow her to go to school. So that was my thinking. So I, so I didn't bother to even look at any of the major predominantly white universities that had catalogs that goes back centuries, you know. So I didn't bother to even look there because I didn't think that I would find anyone. So I started looking and found out that there were uh, African-American pharmacy schools that was created because they were not allowing African-Americans to go to some of your major universities, so they created their own schools. And I, then, it, then, then all of a sudden, this 
this little, uh, I guess like a light went off in my head, said, oh, then that's probably where she was, that's probably where I would find the woman. I would probably find her at those schools. So I went looking for the records and lo and behold, the records were just not available. You just could not find them. It appears that all those records have been destroyed or lost in some way. So I call the National Institutes of Medicine, the um, all the congressional libraries in the country. And there were quite a few very smart librarians who had heard of the schools, but had no records. So I was then that, that just made me a little, little bit more motivated to keep looking. So it, it led me to actually finding the records on seven of those schools. They were records was incomplete, by the way. I may find many times I found one record when the school may have been open for 17 years and I couldn't find all 17 years worth of records. So I asked a lot of people had they heard of these schools and these black pharmacists, and people said no. They never knew they exist. Well, neither did I. So it led me to writing a story about it. So I wrote um, a historical story about those, about the schools, not about the people in them, but the schools. And I submitted it for publication and to several journals. But now the document was very long. It was about 80 pages long. So no one would publish it because they said it was too long. Nowadays, most publications want something very short. They want something about, at maximum, five pages. So, they, so one major publication that really would have benefited from it wanted to publish it, but they told me that I have to reduce the size of it. They wanted me to take out all the photos. They wanted me to take out all the tables and put only just a minimum number of tables that I had created. And they wanted me to reduce it down so that it must be no more than five um, type pages, double space. <laughs> and I said, no way, I'm not going to do that because you're, you're taking away my story. I'm trying to tell the story and you're going to take it away from me. I'm not going to do that. So they were trying to, they offered several writers to work with me to help me write it a certain way. And I said, no, because they're only going to take away this beautiful story that I just found. I spent three years trying to trying to research and find. So uh, I couldn't, so I took it to another uh, journal that called the Pharmacy and History Journal that's, that's published by the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy, which I thought they would want it. And they, they basically told me the same thing. They like it. They would accept it being a little long, but it's too long. And I thought again, well, I'm just not going to change this story. I think the story is too important and too significant to be cutting it short like that. So then, uh, then I, I, I had one of my professors that works with me, he, he's published numerous books. So he just told me, why don't you just publish, publish it as a book? I have several self-publishing book companies that he worked with and he told me I should be able to work with them. So I started working with a different publisher and that's how the book got started. So it should be coming out any day now. I, I'm waiting for them to send me the final, the final version of it um, any day. They said it would be before the holidays. So that's uh, probably two weeks from now. I should, more or less than two weeks, I expect to get that book back. And what is, what is the name of the book? It's called The uh, Early Education of African-American Pharmacists. I, they cha I changed the name, it was very long. And shorten the name, um, and I'm thinking about. I do have the option to change it back, so I may just change it again. But that's the title of it now. Um, and so, um, once once they send me back the 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 next formatted copy, then we have to design the cover. I've already designed my cover, and they are willing to accept the design that I came up with. So, just be a matter of reviewing it, putting the cover together creating a, a copy to look over and then mass producing it in some copies. So I think hopefully before the holidays come up, I should be able to get the book out. And, and so, I, so you didn't, you, you actually started out researching and trying to find the answer to a question. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, you've got this story that's too long to be a short story in a publication and you know so you haven't actually started out 
looking to write a book. But again, it's a bit like when you were stood in that queue and you crossed the box out, you end up starting out doing one thing and you end up somewhere else. Exactly. Exactly. And some people look at that as a, I had a young lady just tell me, uh, she's a friend of mine, just told me um, last Friday that, that I don't plan things very well because I'm always jumping around to different things. Well, I don't know if that's actually true. There is some truth to that, if you depend on how you look at it. But sometimes you don't know what you want to do all the time. And it's not that you didn't plan it, you just didn't know. So once you learn what you want, then you change your direction. So that's kind of what I, that's how I looked at it. I never looked at it that I was very bad at planning. And in that case, I, um, maybe there's some other things I am. But don't you think though, because I know I'm, I write a blog about the Falklands and I have, it's a very, obviously a very completely different subject. And it's, it's, it's nevertheless takes a huge amount of research and you know the blogs themselves are short stories so you know they have to be short stories because by the very nature of a blog they're short and um you know when i start researching i i have pages of stuff and i have you know sort of uh, things pared down to you know different ships so i think sometimes bad planning is not bad in itself because you know when I'm doing the Falklands blog you know I I end up having stuff all over the place and I've got notes all over the place and you know how it goes when you're researching something you jot things down and you put things wherever but if I'm working on for example at the moment I've been working on HMS Arden and then suddenly somebody contacts me and that person you know, it gives me some information or wants to help me with researching somebody that was in the parachute regiment or the Marines, then I will switch to that story because that's there in front of me, you know. So I have kind of still not developed a, a methodical way of working, but nevertheless sort of, you know, by not necessarily being a good planner, I've ended up sort of going from a very small project to a massive one. So, you know, the fact that you couldn't, and I don't think you should have tried to reduce that story down. I think it's great that you stuck to your guns on it. You've now got this exciting book coming out. Right. Yeah, it, it, there, are, there, are, there are so many side stories to, that are built into this one. And I have to be disciplined to not venture off too far into some of the other stories. I, I, I can actually see where this work could be something I could do for a lifetime because there's so many stories that are built into one story. And I constantly keep putting aside the way you, what you just described. I got maybe several big files right now where I'm collecting things. And now I'm, I, I'm, I'm using the files as a backup because save part of it. I've organized a filing system electronically and I also have a paper file because I still like to read read the papers, but I can see so many different stories right now. And, and so I have to sort of be patient to sort of hold myself back from going too far from an impulse on one thing that I find when I'm looking for something else so that I can finish the thing that I started on. Just um, a few weeks ago, one of the national pharmacy associations here in this country um, wanted to know if I had some additional stories besides this one that I'm writing about. I said, of course I do. I always <laughs> got <laughs> loads of them. Yeah, I got a bunch of them. Yeah. I, I, I have one that I, one that I really, um, that really stands out. I actually looked at it last night before, before we started our conversation. It's, it's, really, it's really about a young lady. Her name is Lo, Lorena Shoes. She's from a place called Shelbyville, Tennessee in the South. And she comes from a family where she's the youngest in the family, but she has two older brothers who left home from a little country town and became, one became a dentist and one became a physician. So she followed in her brother's footstep and went to this school in, in the South and where it was very segregated and started her pharmacy career there. And she transferred for some reason that I haven't found out yet in the story. 
to the University of Iowa, which is in the north Midwest part of the United States in a very uh, segregated area where there was a, this was, this was like, I'm talking about a period around 1920, where it was very, still very, very um, set, segregated during that time period. But the, but the interesting part about what stimulated me to possibly look at another story is that this was during a time period when there was all these stereotypes about black men, you know, who uh, you could never compete with the white men in athletics because they always thought the black men may win and they, they weren't going to have that. They, they just felt that, you know, we can't let that happen. So they would, they would not let black men compete in collegiate sports. And so they, they allowed this one young black girl to do that. She competed in the very first national collegiate sporting event at the University of Iowa. And they treated her so bad, she had to train at, on her own out in little facilities that were not even conducive for her to become a winner in dirt tracks and dirt roads and all these little things that she had to run in. She was not allowed to come into the gymnasium. She was not allowed to attend the cafeteria services. She was not allowed to swim in the swimming pool because they felt if she got in there, they have to drain the pool because I guess they thought she would contaminate the pool. And so she she could not she got to train on her own. So when she got into the net and the day that they had the national event, she won all the races and set a set a, a university record in the speed in those fast in those races. What now they are different, but it was called the fifty yard dash, the seventy five yard dash, and the hundred yard dash. Now they just they don't have the fifty and seventy five anymore. They just got the one hundred meter. So, but she, she set a record, she set a school record. And so at the time they were not keeping national records. I've been trying to find out if her time was a national record and that's, and, and so she won and she beat the top female athlete that had been the top lady for the last two years at the college, at the university. She, she won the event, but, but there were some other um, events that they had to participate in such as javelins and a few other things that she didn't compete in and therefore she came in second place in total points wow that's amazing so you got all these stories within a story yeah but the significance of that story was that there were other women of color that came in behind her then two years later the men came in so she opened the door for all these black men to to play collegiate sports Nobody knows that story. So, so what I have here is a story that I can probably build upon. My gut is that she was not the only one. She may have been the one the first year, but that was 19, 20, 21. So in 22, 23, there were some other women. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm thinking I have here is another story where I can research it to the point of putting together all of these women and using those women's stories to make a significant uh, to show their significance, the significance of their accomplishments. They, like women do all the time, women open their doors for men. Men always think that they usually take a back seat to them, but they, they're the one who, who forces men to the top most of the time. They're the one who elevate them, who support them to get them to the top in so many different ways that we don't always appreciate. And so this was one example where women opened the doors for men athletics that no one seemed to think about. I don't think they even thought of that story or even definitely has not given it any attention. So well, we always have this saying, you know, that behind every successful man, there is a good woman, you know, yeah. and we kind of tend to, it's great, very generous of you to say this. And it's, it's lovely to hear you saying it because, you know, we, we tend to think of that saying and we tend to think of all these successful men across, you know, history, irrelevant of what their color is, you know, and, and those people have, have got this woman behind them supporting them and, you know, looking after them on the home front and all that kind of stuff and being their, their support system. But you're talking about a whole Whole different thing you're talking about you know uh, women opening doors for men and being the first to do stuff that's incredible yeah it really is and, and so that in itself plays into a, a bigger story that I think we can build from this and so 
I was explaining that to um, to one of the people who asked me if I had other stories. And I said, yeah, I do. I have quite a few other stories. And so this one would require a lot more research and a lot more development. But I think it's um, it can be done. I feel pretty strong that I can with another story. So that's that's just one one idea there. And so, but, but there are so many more that, that have come from from this one project. So, how many books do you think you've got in you? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, if I can make it, if I can live long enough, I probably got a good five or six left. Um, wow! It, it just—I I, realize I can't roll them out very fast, but because m- much of the research isn't done, you got to do all the research, and that could take you months to do that. And so, by the time, but here's what I'm thinking though. My my dean at my school has asked me to create a coalition of people to work with, and I sort of and and I'm I'm seriously planning on doing that, building a group of people. I you know, for example, I may give you a, a winner for that at well and say I want you to write on her, and we add her to the book. So that's what I'm thinking of doing: giving people an assignment and say, look, if you just work on this part, you get added into the book as a contributing author to the book. That that would be incredible because, you know, that was <laughs> that was something that I saw on the news this week. Um, you know, we yeah. we have this scheme in the UK, uh, uh, you know, where we have this blue plaque scheme. And, you know, so if anybody's famous, like, for example, you know, Ian Fleming that kind of, you know, was the author of James Bond and all that, you know, there's a plaque on the house saying this is where he lived and all those kind of things. And it was just on the news, you know, I was getting ready to have this conversation conversation with you and it was just on the news a couple of days ago about how Winifred Atwell you know had had a black plaque put on and it was actually the building where she had a, a health and beauty shop so it kind of went on to tell the story and I immediately thought of you you know because she was a pharmacist um, who uh, I suspect if that plaque is going on that building and it was a health and beauty store she was using her experience and knowledge to help women with their hair which would have been very well received back in those days but you know quite a lot about her don't you yeah yes uh, she she did work she did she sort of worked as a hairdresser and like a lot of, a lot of women during that time period that was sort of their business they could go into without having to spend a lot of time going to school so she was one that did that as well but um, um, she also um, she also had a father who um, was a pharmacist, and she he wanted her to become a pharmacist, and he was going to train her as an apprentice, which was different from going to school. It was like you would spend so many years training under someone who was a registered pharmacist. And then you take an exam, and once you take the exam, that's how you became a person. You didn't have to go to years of school like we do today, and that was um, that became part of the process of becoming a pharmacist. But she chose not to do that. She wanted to. She loved her music and entertainment of playing for people um, um, at a military base that was in Trinidad. And from there, she found her way to the UK and got a record deal to make an instrumental song during a period when they had this music called Boogie Woogie Music, where it's like a really upbeat, upbeat dance music. And that was how she got her first recognition. She also married, she also met, I can't remember his name, she married a stand-up comedian. So the comedian and her used to perform together at different shows and and for years and years and then he later got ill and died and she continued and eventually moved from the UK to uh, I believe Australia where she yeah. had a second home I think she died there yeah I, I I was I was actually reading up a little bit about her earlier and um uh, you know, not only I know we were talking about it before we we started this conversation, but you know, not only was she the first black person, not not woman, but person to have a number one hit in the UK singles chart, she is still the only female instrumentalist to do so. 
Word. So that's that, that's an incredible achievement. And uh, apparently, I know it was boogie woogie and ragtime. And uh, apparently, when I read up on her, they said that she was actually a very shy person, even though she had this famous wink that she used to do in her performance. You know, she used yeah. to kind of wink at the audience. But and and she was a, she was an incredible performer. You know, if you listen to her, but she was nevertheless apparently quite shy. And um, it's according to Wikipedia, she sold over twenty million records. Right. Which is a, yeah. a a huge number. Well, you know, she's one of the women I want to include. In, I want to include in this next book. Um, uh, I I I have her on my list as one of those women to include, and uh, there is a. I'm trying to think of creating like a little section of women who may have been trained as pharmacists, but their career was launched in another area, another field of, another field. So she's one. And then as um, Ann Petrie, you may know Ann Petrie was this famous writer. And no one knows that she's also was a pharmacist, trained as a pharmacist, went to the University of uh, Connecticut as a pharmacist. But she, she practiced for maybe two years and then she, she found her blood as a writer. She was the first African-American woman to sell a million copies of her book. And so, so that's, so it's her winning for that well. And there's a few others that have, have uh, started out in one way, but ended up in another field that made them very famous. And I, I'm trying to remember the others, but there are, there are a few others. So I was thinking about grouping those into one group and then writing a, a, a story about all of them under um, women who may have been, who have a pharmacy background, but actually became famous in another field. I know it must be quite a hard question to answer, given how many people you've researched, but do you actually have a favorite? Yes, I do. Yeah, well, I have one that I, I guess you would call her a favorite because I find myself thinking about her so often. Um, her name is Edna Roshan Boutte. She, the, her history is what fascinates me. She comes from a long lineage of, of slaves that were owned by royal family that, that bought a plantation in Louisiana. So her, I can't remember how far back, but it goes back maybe five generations back a great 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 grandfather, a grandmother maybe, um, was part of two families during that time. The the owner of the, the plantation had a real wife. He had a wife that he was legally married to, and he had a common law wife, which was the the slave girl. And so he had children being birthed from both sides of the family in the same in the same house. And so he could never, he could never, he never granted the wife, the, the, the slave girl, her freedom, but he gave the freedom to the children. And so then the children that she had, uh, when he passed away, became part owner of, of his assets that he left behind. The mother, by the way, belonged to the children. So he never gave the mother her freedom. So she was really the, the mother who belonged to the children, but the children who she had basically raised as a nanny uh, gave her her freedom. And she ended up marrying a very wealthy man, more, married several wealthy men, I think two different men, because of her connection to the, the French owner of the slave plantation. To make a long story short, uh, Edna Rochon Boutte was the daughter of a, one of the children, his name was Victor Roshan. Victor Roshan be, um, became the, um, the first, one of the first uh, black politicians after, after the end of the Civil War, during this period they call Reconstruction. That's when they started giving black people the opportunity to run for office, to vote, and those kind of things. So he became a, a state senator. And he had a daughter named Edna. 
that he had several daughters, Edna, Anita, and one named Elizabeth. Well, Edna was um, uh, one, of, one of the children who became a school teacher and one, and she later married a gentleman named um, Matthew Butte, and they both became pharmacists. And so, um, Valerie Jarrett, who is the, was the um, political advisor to President Obama, is her great great grand niece. And so that story comes up in my mind quite a lot because I think I, I can't really give you all the details because I can't remember all the details, but I definitely have researched the family and I went through the whole entire family tree. It's quite fascinating. It's just really intriguing. I even reached out to her French ancestors in France. And wow. Spoke, spoke to them about her. I emailed them back and forth, back and forth. And they had some more details for her story that I didn't have. They told me how she, where she they told me about a church that still is located in Louisiana that's being used now, I believe, as a bed and breakfast place. But it used to be a church years ago. Uh, not a church, I'm sorry, a school, a school that she went, that she attended. So I looked that up and sure enough, there is a there is an old school that was used as a bread and breakfast. So there's so much about her story that I find fascinating. And so her and Matthew, um, moved to New York and she became she formed what she became head of this what they call the Circle for Negro War Relief. It was an organization formed by a very wealthy white female who who put her in charge of it. And then when she passed away, um, Edna continued to run this, this service. What it was, it was similar to um, what we call the Red Cross, which was a an organization that provided service for, for war veterans who were injured in the war. They grew up, this was World War One, and mostly World War One, and I think this, um, uh, yeah, that was the main war. There, there was another one before that I can't remember exactly now, but, but so those soldiers would come back and they were, uh, the, the black soldiers were not given the same services. They may have a, a leg that's been amputated and they need certain prosthetics and wheelchairs and things and they couldn't get it. So she formed this, or she was part of this organization who, went about providing those services to those war veterans. So that's that's one thing that I think is very, very striking to me when I read her story. And so later she went back and formed, uh, she got a master's degree, she went back to school in France, got a master's degree in, in French, came back to New York, set up a French school, went to Columbia University, got another master's degree, and then later on got a pharmacy degree from Columbia and went into business with her husband. And they had a very successful business in New York for a number of years. And so when Matthew died and they buried him in the Arlington National Cemetery for soldiers, she was buried right alongside of him. And so I, I love her story. I just love it. I just, I, whenever I get a chance, I always get caught up guard to talk about it. And I haven't done my background check on her, but she has a very fascinating story. Um, and they did a documentary on her niece, her great great grandniece, a few about two years ago, and they only mentioned her name, but they didn't tell her story. And I said, I wonder why they didn't go into more detail about her story. But that gives me a chance to write about it. And I can write more about it myself. Well, maybe they didn't know because these things do take a lot of research, don't they? So you know, yeah, they may only have me. known a part of the story, and so they tell a part of the story. Yeah. And I do really, I mean, I really appreciate because, you know, however short the stories of that I write about the people that died in the Falklands, you know, they're, they're, they take a lot of time to research. And sometimes, particularly if there's been an adoption or, you know, certain things, you know, you go through the records and they're not easy to, to research. It just takes hours and hours and hours sometimes just to write a couple of paragraphs, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it certainly does. I have spent sometimes four to six hours trying to find one bit of information. That, that it could be something as simple as asking a question, where did she go to school? And so just trying to find the school, and once you find the school and get the name of it, you, you then ask another question, what did she, gra did she graduate from the school? Did she get a diploma? 
What did she, what type of degree did she receive? Those things can take days to find that, that information. And you know that it's there. That's what makes you keep looking. You know that the information has to be there. It's just a matter of finding it. Yeah, it, 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 that is exactly it. And sometimes it can be very painstaking and, you know, it does take a long time just to find one piece of, of information. And you know, the next thing you know, you know, you've been at it for seven hours. And, you know, I really relate to that because of the length of time I spend researching. But it's worth it, isn't it? You know, when you get these stories and you get them, you, you kind of, you bring a character to life when you do this. Certainly. It, 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 I, I, I tell everyone the excitement is something that I, I can only try to express it because I, you, I can't tell you how it feels like. But you have to feel it yourself. When you find it after been looking for hours and you finally find it, it's like you want to jump up and celebrate. You know? <laughs> Some people don't understand that, but if you, if you, if you have, I'm sure you do, because if you do the research and you you've been looking for hours and you find it, it's like it's it's like you want to jump up and yell and scream almost because you finally found it. It's like, gosh, I found it, and so yeah, you, yeah. And the in the excitement. in the UK, you know, I have access to all of the records so that I can research people's, you know. Um, families and siblings and all that kind of thing but in the UK we have a particular difficulty with Scotland and Ireland so you know uh, a lot of times when I'm trying to research somebody the minute I see that they were born in somewhere in Scotland you know whether I can get access to any records or not is a massive question mark. And so then you're trying to research people that may have known them or, you know, try and find somebody, as you say, you know, when you're talking about these people in France that you've got these emails going backwards and forwards and, you know, it's trying to, you know, get the information from people and get them to be wanting to be, you know, giving information and putting a piece in that jigsaw puzzle because it is, isn't it? Sometimes it's like a really big jigsaw puzzle and the pieces are quite small. And it takes such a long time to do it. But yeah, I really relate to it because I kind of leap up and down sometimes when something comes in and you go, yes, you know, I can really sort of put that together now. Yeah. Uh, I use um, a software called Ancestry.com. And I start there first when I start with, a, especially if it's a biography on a, on a person, I want to build their family tree. I, I use... Um, a simple little table of organization, like you see in a business corporate area. So I have a head person, and then it could be the father. And then from there, I have a little box to the left of it. It, it automatically creates that box for you. Put the wife there. And then below, you put the children. And then as it spreads out, you put the spouses of the children. And then the children of the children, <laughs> and it goes from there. So, and, and, in, and in doing that, I'm always looking up, I, I have an outline. The outline is, in the outline, it's, it asks the question, who is a mother, who is a father? Where were they born? What year were they born? Um, did, did they go to school? And where did they go to school? Um, what occupation did they, did they hold? And then, um, uh, who were who were their mother and father? Yeah. And what did they do? And then you you start. And then you go down to the children. So once I got it on a graph on a on a table, I can look at the table and I can tell you the story. And people say, "How do you do that?" I said, "Well, I I'm just I can tell you by looking at this table that the father of the family was Victor. He was married to Elizabeth." And he had three daughters, and there's this. I, I, I got it right here. I can. I got it all mapped. I got it all. Yeah. yeah. I can go right now. So then, then it becomes easy to write. I sit down. I start writing the story just the way it's is built on the outline. Once I've gotten the family part built, the next question is: If I'm focusing on one person in that family, I want to know things like um, where does she go to? her primary school, secondary school, her college, and, and get into details as to what she may have majored in, what she may have gotten a degree in, 
um, and what were some of the major accomplishments after that? Who did she marry? How many children did she have? And, and when did she die? So when you're, when you're looking into the education side of things, has that involved, I mean, obviously we've, we've had a bit of a change in, in circumstances this year with the whole COVID thing, but, you know, has that literally involved you getting in the car and going actually to different places to look, actually look up records? Well, well I, I've only, well, I haven't been at all. What I've been doing is ordering the records. If I can find them, I'll order them, by, I'll get them, get them on a loan. They're like bar the records here, but you gotta, you gotta do it through another library. So I have a, our university library allows me to request the records from say the Library of Congress. And they will send the records to them. I go and I make copies of them. I can download files and save them myself and then send them back. And um, that's one way. So then we have a, and you probably have access to it there. It's called Haiti. Some people call it Haiti Trust, it's, but I, I call it Happy Trust because it looks like it spells, it spells like it should be happy. H-A-I-T-H-I. And the second word is trust, T-R-U-S-T. What that is, it's a digital historical library. And it's, it's, it's massive. I mean, it's massive. I think it may be owned by um, someone like an Amazon or someone like that. And so I, I, I use all of the tools I can. I'll, I'll try to use my main library and I use a digital library. And I'll try to see if I can find the item there. And if you can, you may be able to download it and get it from there. And if you have photos in it, you can snip them. You can snip the photos right out, but I use a snippet tool to, to capture the photos. And so I, I, I start first with the ancestry tool to build a family. Then when I get down to trying to understand where they went to school, that I go to the Happy Trust and I go to, and, and then there I, it allows me to look up their schools, um, as much as you can get out of there, sometimes it has all, many of the catalogs and the commencement records and in some cases, uh, photos. Then I also have another tool called yearbook, eyearbook.com. And I subscribe to that one. It allows me to look up schools uh, all over the place, and it, it, all the way from high schools, elementary schools, to colleges and universities. And in there, um, a lot of the records are missing, by the way, but, but you may get lucky and find some where it has a complete list of all the school records. And there and that there you can find photos, photos of when they were may have been 14 years old, when they were teenagers, and even college photos. And I'm able to go in and snip those photos out and build a story with pictures in it as well. And then when I try to look for their accomplishments, it's hard to find. I can tell you where I would go to look for, for what went for that world. I would probably go to newspapers because most likely she, she had a lot of newspaper headlines. Yeah, yeah, she would have done. Yeah, and so you'll find a lot of the stories right there. So people sometimes ask me when I write something, they say, where did you find that detailed information like that? I said, well, it was in the newspapers. They said, yeah, I, I get it. I go, the newspapers is part of my routine tool that I use. I go right to the newspapers. I put a lot of search words in there until you finally build a story from there. And so I, I use about maybe four to five electronic tools. And so my last, my last resort is to travel to the location. I got plans to go to Boston because it has a long history there of a lot of things that I'm going to learn there, other places in the South, but I, I have not traveled there yet because of the, the pandemic but uh, I do I do intend to go to those places like you mentioned to try to spend some time even if I have to, try to interview some people it, it really is incredible and I I, I think people <laughs> often don't realize you know when you're putting stories together how much painstaking research goes into it you know because if these stories were out there in in in, in total you wouldn't be writing this book because it would all be out there already wouldn't it 
That's correct. Yeah. So you're kind of, you know, in a way making history. And that that's what got me really into writing the, the Falklands blog, because as we were getting older, you know, people were naturally starting to get to the age of sort of passing over. And, you know, you realize that if you don't log these things, they, they can well be lost. And, you know, back, ironically, you know, in the sort of, you know, early 1900s so you know you go back to the late 1800s and you go into up to 1910 and 1911 census you know you can find huge amounts of information about people's families but in the UK the 1920 census is yet to be published because it's like 100 years you know so when that comes out that's going to be a a lot more helpful to research in terms of finding records um but, you know, sometimes uh, you think that there won't be mistakes. But I think I found one guy and there was a massive mistake on his death record. You know, it was it was something like a 10 years. It was 10 years out. I can't remember the actual details, but I, I remember I, I thought I must go back and sort of, you know, report that to them because it. You think that the records are going to be perfect, but they're not always, are they? And sometimes you yeah. need other, other things to cross check. Exactly. Um, there are quite a lot of mistakes. I, I see the same thing. Quite. Um, and and did, I, did you did you have the same thing over there as well? Because you know, uh, when they used to do the censuses over here, um, a lot of people were actually pretty illiterate. You know, back a hundred years ago, so not everybody could write. So, um, you know, when somebody went around to do the official census, they would often, you know, give their age as a year out or they spell their name differently because they couldn't spell you know and it so you you have to have these wild cards and you know try and sort of piece things together sometimes oh, same same thing same thing happens here too when i go look at census records uh, even my own family my grandmother's name is spelled incorrectly twice on the census twice is spelled incorrect and so um it happens here quite a quite a lot as well but you can kind of put it together just by having an idea of what you're looking for. And you see that and say, okay, I think they really mean this is um, this probably Alex. And they may have it spelled A L I X or something like that. Yeah. So um, that's just, and I've seen that quite, a, quite often. So when I'm working with my students, I tell them, don't be so quick to believe everything that you see there. You have to cross check somehow. You, you do. And, and I think, you know, uh, some of the things that you're saying today, you know, it, it really is important when you are teaching anything that you, A, encourage people to not give up and to keep going and to focus on whatever goal they've got but also to not take everything literally and, you know, make sure and check and double check. Right. Yeah, I, I just discovered a, a school that was set up for um, black children in Washington, D.C. And me and uh, myself and another researcher has been looking, he, he is an actual trained historian, I'm not. So he's trained, he's trained to do historical research. And so I found this, school, so I shared it with him a few weeks ago. And I said, this, I, I discovered this school. And it's amazing how people who are experts at history, they, they know a little bit about everything that you bring up. And, and they'll say, oh, I've heard of that, but I didn't have all the details you have, but, but they can go into more detail to explain it. Anyway, he was telling me that the school I found is probably the same school that had a different name, and I and, and I was not so sure I wanted to buy that. Then I thought about it and said, "Well, maybe you got a point there because the other that was another school we were looking for that was open at the same time period is called the Washington College of Pharmacy in Washington D.C. Can't find anything. There is no records. We have not found out one record. This is a guy who's a Ph.D. who does this for a living. He can't find the records either." So he thinks that it, he thinks that it probably existed under a different name, 
and that the school that I found is probably the school that's called the Washington College of Pharmacy. I, I hear what he's saying, but it's hard. I haven't quite been sold on the idea just yet because I believe that there are certain things I've seen that don't quite match up. You know, the time period is overlapping, but it's not the same. Yeah. It, there's a lot of little things like that. So so I, before I, I really settle on that, that idea that I, I need to, I want to double check it and, and probably look into some other possible leads that I think that may, that may, uh, that may be the answer, but I'm not sure. And so, and he's not either, but he was just, that was, that was just a theory that, that he had a question that he's raising also that stimulates you to look even further. I think you may well not be a historian, um, but that's not necessarily the hat that you wear professionally, but uh, you've got a massive passion, which I really do understand because I've got a very, huge passion for the writing that I do and I think when you've got that passion you put so much effort into it you put so much energy into it you come up with something that hopefully can bring a, a person really to life in what you write so it's it's just great talking to you about it um when I mean obviously the book is fairly imminent now where will it be available from if people want well, to kind of, want to get it it's going to be on Amazon. It's going to be part of Apple. The digital, the uh, digital version is going to be on Apple. The Barnes and Noble's bookstore. There's a. It's being distributed in the UK too, but I can't remember the name of the distributor. I'll get that for you, but it, it will be available there too. Um, I, I'll let you know more. I can't remember all the details of how they're going to roll it out, but it's going to be um, distributed quite. Um, on a large platform. Now, what is sales and the one story, but they got it set up for it to really be, really be put out there. And then I'm going to do my own self marketing myself. I'll try to, um, I'm working on a website now and I'll probably have, so I've got a marketing platform already set up that I'm paying for now. And once it's out, I'm going to be sending it out to uh, myself and trying to, trying to get it in front of people. I plan to give away a large amount of them to schools. Uh, I'm going to probably buy several hundred copies myself and, and give those away uh, to, um, to, to schools and young, young people. And so um, that's kind of the plan now, but it, 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 it will be available and I'll get, your, I'll get your copies of it as well soon. That's um, brilliant. <laughs> John, it's been so good speaking to you today. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure your teaching career is far from over and um, it sounds like you've got a fair bit of writing ahead of you as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great. You're welcome, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't kidding when I suggested that you write the story on Gwyneth for that. Well, uh, we have an outline. It's simple, just... I, I, I give, I've, I've asked a few other people to help me with different parts. I give them the outline and I say, whatever you can find, I, already, I, I understand how difficult it is to follow that. It's not, it's not difficult to follow the outline if you got the information to put in it. But if you don't have the information, it's hard to follow. So what I've been telling people, just follow the outline as closely as you can. Yeah. Put in as much as you can find in there and just write it in your style that you want. The only thing I would ask is that you follow the same format for doing the referencing, but the, your style of writing, I don't tell people how to write, I let them write the way they want to. Now, if, if I think they're missing something, I'll try to add it to it. If they miss some information, I, and if I can find it, I'll look it up. But, but usually um, that's the only thing I, I, I had two people to help me write stories and they did a really good job and I don't go back other than to read it to see if there's something I can add. But, um, but the only thing that I try to make sure we, we are consistent on is the formatting of the references, that they're formatted the same way. And, 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 and I got a, a guide for that. But the writing is, um, I, I have people that are much better writers than me, so I don't try to change. I, I, I mean, look to see if they left something out. If they did, I'll add it, but i add it in there, but I don't really try to change their word, how they write it, you know. 
Well, so, I look forward to having a little dig into that one then as well. All right. Thank you so much. It's Thank been great, you. great talking to you. That concludes episode seven of Alternate Realities, a truly inspirational conversation today. I first met John over 10 years ago when he was working at the hospital in Miami. And as that job came to an end, his life completely changed direction in so many ways. The last few years that he has spent researching has been painstaking to be able to bring to you the book that he's about to publish. It's so interesting in how our lives are so different in so many ways. We're in different countries, we're opposite sides of the pond, and yet we both ended up writing about people that need to be remembered in history for what they have done and for what they have contributed to society and the world at large. Researching takes a very long time. It can be hours, it can be days, and sometimes weeks to find one little tiny piece of information that appears to be a very small part of a jigsaw puzzle, and yet that piece of information opens up the whole picture to enable us to bring that character to life. Episode 8 will be with you shortly, when I will look forward to bringing you another inspirational story. Thank you for listening today.